Hey, podcast listener, even if you are alone in your entrepreneurial pursuit, know that today, right now in your earbuds, you are joined by thousands of entrepreneurs all around the globe seeking to do the same thing you are. If you want to know more about this program or this podcast or want to get barraged by a lot of annoying pop-ups, check out our website, lifestylebusinesspodcast.com. Yeah, buddy, it's Thursday. That means it's time for another Lifestyle Business Podcast, otherwise known as the LBP. Hashtag, yeah, buddy. That's where we believe building a business is the ideal way to create more freedom and opportunity for you, your family, and those around you. Those around me is my captain, my co-host, the man who puts the biz into business. And today we've got a special guest. Talk about business. Mr. Brendan Tully is rocking my world. That guy's super smart. So we invited him onto the show because he's got the goods. If you guys stick around to the end of the episode... We're going to share with you a crazy scientific way that you can discover small tweaks in your business that could produce huge results. Today, we're not talking about 80-20 principle. Ian, we're talking about 99-100 principle. How are you doing? Word. All right. Shouts, news, questions. Final call for Tropical MBA 9 applicants. That's right. If you want to join us in Bali, get paid to do it. Join our startup. It's a baller opportunity. It's really a life-changing thing. Go check it out. Tropical MBA 9. Ian, are you going to apply? I'm not only going to apply, I'm going to be there. I'm going to show up when we pull the name from the hat. You know, my iTunes iPhone sync has been messed up for like three or four weeks because of a technical issue. So I've been downloading podcasts directly to my iPhone, which has sort of hampered my ability to explore new podcasts. Well, I finally got that fixed up yesterday because I'm going traveling. And I downloaded all these new episodes of This Week in Startups or otherwise known as Twist, Jason Calacanis' show. And I got to say, man, it's been good. Like, really, really good. They have so many awesome episodes. I'm going to link to some of my favorites in the show notes of this show. I mean, that show is really strong. I mean, probably better than the Lifestyle Business Podcast, let's be honest. What? Yeah, I mean, oh, man, it's so good. So go anyway, if you want to listen to some really smart, really high-level dudes, I do recommend Twist. Also, Startups for the Rest of Us has been crushing it. I really enjoy that show. Speaking of uh, another set of guys that are smarter than us, I really enjoy listening to Startups for the rest of us. Pumped that they're continuing to put out regular episodes. And if you do enjoy the show, please do step into that clunky iTunes interface and give us a review ski. We got 78 five-star reviews like a boss. That's huge. What do you say we get moving on to the meat and potatoes, man? We got a really cool discussion today, Ian. Let's do it. All right, guys, today for the meat and potatoes, we're going to talk about a new concept called a CNE that our guest today, Brennan, brought on my plate. Real quick, Brennan, what is it that you currently do? What kind of problems do you solve for your clients? So, our business is probably best described as an online marketing consultancy. So, we work primarily with Australian local businesses, kind of bricks and mortar and online retailers in generally Sydney or Perth. And we do things like SEO and AdWords and web design. So, basically, help them get more hits help them get online and get more new customers and make more sales using the internet. So you brought this concept to my plate called the CNE or the critical non-essential. Can you explain in a nutshell what this is and why it can be a useful concept for business owners? People talk about the 80-20 rule and those things that they can implement in their business to give them leverage. The CNE is more like a 99 to 1. So really tiny little things that you can implement that are so simple that they're often neglected, but they can make a world of difference in terms of making more sales or giving clients value or generally improving the performance of the business. I'm just going to butt in and say what I love about the CNE is that it's just a, such a simple framework for thinking about proactive things that you can do with relatively low bandwidth to make a huge difference in your business. So often we get reactive in our businesses and only act when we need to. And this is sort of an opportunity to step up and do something proactive for your business. So we're going to list off eight CNEs that we've all identified in our businesses that have had huge effects. And then at the end of the episode, we're going to talk about sort of two discovery tools that you could use to find your own CNEs in your businesses. So Brendan, let's start off with a few of your CNEs that you've found. The first one's interesting. You do monthly reports and a monthly client call that you commit to every month. Let us know how this works and and what kind of benefit you're seeing in, in your business. So really simple. So the first part is the monthly report. So they get a PDF 
that combines their keyword rankings in the search engines alongside some Google Analytics stats and a few other bits and pieces. And then we schedule in a call at the end of each month to talk through the report. It only goes for 10 or 15 minutes. We talk through you know, five bullet points. What we found is, particularly when we're talking about SEO or AdWords or getting more hits, it's a really difficult concept for some business owners to grasp. So by having the report, it gives them something tangible to look at. It also compares the data to the previous month so they can see the performance. But we found that over time, our relationship with a customer has changed. They want more of a partner and we find that having that call pulls a lot of the problems out of them or the frustrations they're having and just helps us deliver a better service overall. So essentially, this is a simple way that you can retain your clients for longer. Exactly. And the other thing is without giving them something to focus on other than the other kind of official communication they get from your business, which is an invoice, all they've got to look at is, you know, a line item and a price. So by giving them something tangible, it gets their focus looking in the right direction instead of just looking at the price of your service. Right. So in our business, we don't have like a lot of interaction with people outside of our company giving us advice that aren't on the payroll. And I'd imagine the same is true for a lot of other small businesses, unless you're doing something like what you're doing here, which is scheduling a phone call, uh, which is kind of part of your, your product or your service. How helpful do your small business owners find it to get on the phone with kind of like an outside consultant? And how valuable is it to talk to them on the phone? Um, most of them find it really valuable because, like you guys know, when you're stuck in the day-to-day of a business, your focus gets very operational and very tactical. So even just that 10 or 15 minutes pulling their head out of the operational stuff and into more of the strategic stuff really has a lot of benefit. You know, They have things they want to do, but they can't because they're so stuck in the day-to-day. So by having the call, we can actually help them with that. They tell us what they need done, and quite often you know, they need content written or they need you know, some other advertising done. We can often refer them to someone else or it might be a service we provide. Without doing the calls, we really have a very poor client retention rate. As soon as we started doing the calls, retention rate shot up. So definitely some real tangible value they get out of it. I love the call too because it's an opportunity to really build a meaningful relationship with somebody on the phone. It's like those important emails. It's always better to kind of just call somebody and to talk it out with them a lot of the time because so much gets lost in translation. So I I love that you guys are calling. That's great. And especially for, you know, SEO tends to go to the very top in terms of strategy. And you can provide this sort of side service, which is that the entrepreneurs at the top, they want to talk to somebody about strategy. They want to have that kind of outlet for talking about their business at the 40,000 foot level. And it sounds like you're giving them that and then they don't mind that invoice so well. So that's kind of like the sugar pill around that invoice. I like it. Number two, speaking of operations, this is one way that I saved 80K. And one of the things I loved about this discussion so much is that this is a new process that I want to re-implement in our business in a new way. So what I call it is the weekly GTD operational meeting. And what it is, is it's a Friday afternoon meeting that's a half an hour and it's absolutely only a half an hour. Only your top staff. And it's not a time or a forum to discuss things, but rather it's you take every single open thread in your business and you label it with a GTD action item. So that could be like tickle this item for next Tuesday or Ian, you need to email Brian about that, or we're going to put that off in the project folder and revisit it at the next meeting. You really walk out of these meetings feeling like a superhero. In my last business, our operational manager left and we needed to replace him. And this 30 minute meeting ended up replacing his entire job function, which saved us $80,000 annually. So Ian, what do you think about we get back on the weekly GTD operational meetings for the company wide thing? Sound fun? Absolutely. Sounds fun. So number three, this is one we got from Brennan. Follow up emails for your e-commerce business. And we are also talking a little bit about cart abandonment emails. Brennan, talk about how you use follow up emails in your business. It's just insanely simple and so easy to automate. So we get our e-commerce clients to send an email about a week after an order ships just to check in with the customer and see, one, to make sure the orders arrived and two, to make sure that any other questions they have or problems they have are addressed. Normally with our clients, it's such a hard thing to get them to do, but once they start doing it, you can see always five out of 100 people are going to have some issue or some question they have, or they want to buy something else. So 
it's just a really good way of um, checking with your customers and also a really good way of getting testimonials as well. We do this in our business and it's been one of the best things that we've ever done. So uh, we also call people back. And I think a lot of the reason why people don't do this and why we didn't do this in the beginning of our business is because we were really scared about what people were going to say about (laughs) the product that they received or the service that they received. Ouch. Once you start doing it, you really start to get some real feedback about your products. And that's something that you can build on. Let me add a little sugar to this conversation. I was just talking to Simon Stock and Phil S., who's an e-commerce genius. But they're pointing me to amyafrica.com. So we're going to take a look at that and links you up to it in the show notes. What e-commerce nerds are finding is that if you email people that abandon the cart within one hour, there's a whole sequence that these guys are developing by like psychological study or whatever. You know, you send them pictures of the products that they abandon, asking them if there was a problem, this issue. And what they're finding, the results are dramatic. And like you guys said, this is a very easy thing to implement in your business. So this is a major initiative for us over the next few weeks. And I'm looking forward to sharing the results on the program. All right, let's get to number four. Brendan, this is one of yours. Using the first person perspective in emails instead of the second person. We're not grammar nerds. So give us some examples of what you're talking about and what the results are. So two main ways that we use this. The first is straightforward email marketing. A lot of people send big broadcast emails that really impersonal and people just ignore them. Whereas if you use that kind of first person's perspective and the performance of any email marketing campaign skyrocket. And the second way is just general client communications, even as part of the sales process and after someone's sold a new product, instead of sort of using the terms, you should do this and you should try that, talk about we, make it more of a team feeling. And we found that that just generally gives the email a better feel and People are more responsive as well. We use the we thing all the time. And the other day I got called out by this lady who wasn't a we person because uh, I don't think she's ever run a business before and hasn't been in that environment. But I was saying, you know, we do this, we do that. And she said, what do you mean we? I want to know about you. And I said, that is we, you know, that is an extension of we. I totally agree with you there, Brendan. It's good to talk about your team as one moving unit as you were a team. You know, when you're on the field, there's no I and business is the same way. Like a boss. Hey, number five, I want to talk about something that was truly a revolution for our business, sort of a previous business that I ran. This is an example to me of the true power of the CNE. I put myself in my customer's shoes and said, if I were going to cut a deal with a company like this, I would want to hear back within 1.5 hours every time. The problem with that for our operation is that was absolutely impossible for us to deliver bids within 1.5 hours. But I decided that that was the ideal thing. We would be able to cut more sales that way. And so what we had to do is look back at our operation and basically retool our entire way that we constructed pricing and bids. Essentially, we could no longer wait on suppliers to get pricing. And this was a risky thing at the time. And so what I decided to do was build more margin in and start estimating supplier pricing. And then if we scored deals, I would go back and try to backwards negotiate with our suppliers. The impact of this was profound. We got on the Inc. 5000 list. This was a big deal. We more than doubled this year. And this was one of the key processes that we changed in that business. And I think the lesson here, and you really want to think about this stuff in your business, and especially people who are trying to create automated businesses, is I think speed to client is so important in making sales. I know you guys have a lot of experience with this. Uh, can you jump on my bandwagon here? What, how do you guys use speed in order to make sales in, in your businesses? Just setting that higher level of customer service from the outset. People love it and already they're on your side before you've even opened your mouth. So that's how we use it. Same thing as you do. Straight on the emails when, or straight on the phone when someone emails through an inquiry. It's interesting because this kind of CNE causes so much growth pain. We would have that GTD roundup and say, did you respond to every email this week within 1.5 hours? And eventually get in these rhythms where you develop strategies to do so. Maybe instead of responding with the information they asked for, you respond with a status update. And then you give yourself a GTD tickler to get back to them the next day with the information they requested. These CNEs force your organization and your operation to sort of retool assumptions about how you should deal with things in order to meet you know, your target, which in this case is speed. And I can guarantee you, if you add more speed to your organization, you're going to make 
more sales. Let's talk about this one, Brendan. You have a CNE that says add personal photography to your website. I don't think we have this on our website. So what do you think the impact is going to be of adding photography to your website? The reason we don't have this on our website is because we're not as good looking as uh, Brendan over there. It's going to be the opposite impact. Perhaps if we put our photos on, we're going to drop conversion rate. How does this work? I only came across this one maybe 18 months ago and started working with a commercial photographer on a really close basis. Basically, it works like this. 70 to 80% of our buying decision is driven by emotion. The rest are driven by logic. So no matter how many words or features or benefits you have on your website, you're still just appealing to that 20 or 30% logic element. What we found, and it works really well for professional services businesses, is having really good quality people photography really seems to draw people in and makes them engage a lot better with the website. They can see who you are, differentiates you against the competition. It just seems to work really well. And when people buy from a website or a company, they're still buying from people. So people buy from people. And there's three levels of connection that anyone has with a business or a person or um, a service. So first they get to know you, then they get to like you, and then they trust you. So by having that people photography on your website. People get to know you, they get to that first level really quickly and easily. So it allows you to focus on getting them to like you and trust you rather than if it's someone who's just found you off the web, there's no photos, they don't even know you yet. They can't see what you look like. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And that's the reason why um, these days, less and less, we trust sites with stock photography. You're right also to point out that there's kind of guidelines and standards for these type of photography. So I would probably suggest that maybe maybe you keep it conservative, maybe you don't, depending on uh, kind of your company culture in the market that you're in. But I would probably look around and see what other people are doing. Absolutely. So number seven, guys, we do this thing called the Friday Afternoon Report. And this is a report we have come in from all of our freelancers and contract employees, employees that we don't have a daily interaction with. And the idea of the Friday report is basically a results-oriented roundup that takes less than 30 minutes to prepare. But by actually doing the process of the report, it's the same work that you'd want the employee to be doing anyway, which is essentially taking responsibility for the results they're creating and then making them visible to the rest of the organization. So I think the key thing here is not making the report too difficult to produce. So you don't ever wanna turn it into busy work. You always want the report to be sort of the act of discovery and showing that you're creating results. And what I've found with these Friday reports is that you know they've just been knocked down drag out for us. We've been getting great results from them and they really force the, the employee and the company to sort of look in the right direction. So I know Ian, you're a big fan of these Friday reports and you sort of base a lot of your actions off of them. How have they changed the business for you? Yeah, most of them are numbers-based, making decisions off of numbers, not so much emotion. Every Friday, actually, we have a, a numbers report in terms of uh, revenue and profit. And so that's it's a great motivator. So you can either have a good weekend or you can have a bad weekend. <laughs> So final point, Ian, this is one that you brought up, and I think this is a great one. Lunch every eight weeks with your employees, plus our open vacation policy. So let's talk HR. What kind of processes do you use and what kind of results are you seeing? We try to sit down with everybody at least uh, once every eight weeks and kind of have lunch uh, with them and, you know, talk to them like your friend, talk to them like your roommate, like your partner, and uh, kind of see where they're at, you know, inventory their desires, understand how they're feeling about their job and, and how things are going. And I think lunch is a good way to do that. Do you guys do that over there, Brennan? Yeah, I do try and catch up, particularly like we work with a lot of partner companies as well and freelancers. So it's very easy to get into the mindset of just treating them as labor or a number or whatever. But sitting down one on one just really opens up that channel of communication. Totally agree with you. Everybody is at point A and everybody has their own version of where point B is for them. And what I try to do with my key staff is to try to understand really where they want to go with their lives. And then I try to find how that intersects with my company vision. Because what I want to do is I want to make my company their personal superhighway. I want my company to get them to be faster than anything they could imagine for themselves. And I think if you can find that marriage with your employees, you're going to find somebody who's committed to growing things and to moving things forward for your company. So that's one way I utilize that c &E to make a stronger business. We'd love to hear your c &Es. I'm absolutely pumped up about this concept. Let's get moving on to the quick tip, tricks and or funny jokes section. So we've got a few discovery tools in 
in the quick tips section straight from Brendan, man. You're just providing tons of value, man. I love it. Waking up in the morning, going into DC and seeing all the smart people in there and seeing people like you just, it's incredible the kind of value you guys are dropping. I can hardly keep up with it all. We got two discrete quick tips for CNE discovery here. The first one is crazy egg heat map analytics. Maybe we could use the example of this podcast. If we were going to use these heat maps, how would we use them to improve our conversions or and sales? There's a lot of things Crazy Egg can do. One of the really good tools inside there is the confetti heat maps. So what it does, it shows you everywhere on a page on your website, your homepage, for example, where people have clicked. So we use it with our clients in a couple of different ways. One is to optimize the layout of the page. So you probably find there's a whole bunch of stuff below the fold that people are clicking on that they're interested in. That if you moved it above the fold, you probably get even more clicks and more interest in them. So you can use it really to optimize the layout of your website, which engages people better and can often improve your conversion rate. And then the second one is this KISS Insights or 4Q survey. Let us know what these do. So these are called, broadly called, voice of the customer analytics tools, and they're very different to Google Analytics or Crazy Egg or Get Clicky in that. Um, so you've probably seen these little boxes around the web when you visit a website, they pop up on the screen on the bottom right hand corner asking generally two questions. If you achieve the purpose of your visit to the site, if not, why you didn't, if yes, what you liked about the website. So we run them with clients to help us generally improve the conversion rate of websites because there's probably 20 things on your site that you don't know that are wrong or the customer's looking for and you, know, you can get really quick feedback, really actionable feedback where you can implement something really quickly that you know, can dramatically improve the performance of your website. Boom. Huge, man. So what's the best way to contact you? At Tullybo or uh, email me, brendan at thesearchengineshop.com. Thanks for joining us. We've got all that information at the blog. Do check out the blog. We make the most detailed show notes that's David cranking that stuff out. In fact, we're getting a new Tropical MBA to do that stuff. If you'd like to join our team, check out the Tropical MBA 9. It's last call for that stuff. All right, Brennan, thanks so much for joining us. We'll have you back again sometime. Cheers. All right, that was awesome. And as always, we do recommend if you want to create an awesome lifestyle business, do make a cold call. Ian, I'll see you next Thursday. Booyah. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. Don't be shy. We've got a mailing list, lifestylebusinesspodcast.com. Go there, get yourself signed up, and we'll keep you up to date on everything we do.